Okay, everyone, welcome back for our next lecture video that will cover the brain and the cranial nerves. The brain, along with the spinal cord, belongs to the central nervous system. So in chapter 14, we're going to go over the different parts of the brain and what their functions are. And after we cover the brain, we will then discuss the 12 cranial nerves that branch out from the brain. But we're going to start this presentation by learning the different anatomical parts of the brain itself. So the brain can be divided into a few principal parts. We have this portion up here at the top, which is known as the cerebrum. This is the outer portion of our brain. We also will find this portion down here known as the cerebellum. That's what this structure is named. We'll find the diencephalon nestled deep within the brain. And then branching from the brain, giving rise to the spinal cord, is the brainstem. Now we can also see all of these regions shown here on this slide, and some of these regions are going to have subregions that can be found within them. We will come to learn that the diencephalon is going to contain three other structures, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. And we'll also come to see that the brainstem includes the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. But before we get into the different parts of the brain and what their functions are, we want to talk about the brain as a whole and what protective layers we find wrapping around our brain. So while the brain is a part of the central nervous system along with the spinal cord, the brain is going to have the same three protective layers that our spinal cord had, and those are bone, meninges, and cerebrospinal fluid. If you can think back to chapter 13, we had the exact same layers of protection wrapping around the spinal cord. We have an outer layer of cranial bones that wrap around the brain, and these bones form a vault, or a protective cavity that our brain can nicely sit within. We'll also find the cranial meninges, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater in the same arrangement that we saw wrapping around the spinal cord. But there are a couple minute differences between the meninges of the brain and the meninges of the spinal cord. So let's discuss these differences. First of all, just keep in mind that all of these layers wrap around the brain in the same order that they did around the spinal cord. The dura mater is going to be the outermost layer, the arachnoid mater will be the middle layer, and the pia mater will be the innermost layer that actually contacts the brain tissue itself. Now the dura mater that wraps around the brain is actually made up of two other layers. We have the periosteal layer and we have the meningeal layer. Now with the spinal cord, we had an epidural space that sat between the dura mater and the vertebrae bones. Now we're not going to have that same space up here in the brain. The periosteal layer, which is the outer layer of our dura mater, is actually going to be attached to the skull itself, so there will not be any space between the dura mater and the skull bones that wrap around it. And we'll also see the dura mater infolding at certain places to form septa. So these dural septa are invaginations of our dura mater folding into the spaces between different lobes of the brain. So we can see right here on the slides that these dural septa are partitioning different lobes of our brain apart from one another. And this is going to help to keep the brain secure and from moving around a lot inside of the cranial cavity. Now we have some names for three specific dural septa that we find, and each of these dural septa are just named based on which structures they are partitioning. So first and foremost, we have the falx cerebri, Secondly, we have the cerebellar tentorium, and third, we have the falx cerebelli. So one thing that we can see from this slide is that the brain is actually separated into two different halves called hemispheres. We're actually looking at a sagittal section of the brain, and this is the left side of the brain. This here is the left cerebrum, and we will see this actually separate from the right side of the cerebrum. So the dura mater that's wrapping around the outside of the cerebrum is actually going to fold inwards into this space between the left cerebrum and the right cerebrum. And we'll actually see the same arrangement with the cerebellum. We're going to have both a cerebellar hemisphere on the left side and a cerebellar hemisphere on the right side. And both of those are going to be separate from the two cerebral hemispheres. So these dural septa are folding into the spaces between these different hemispheres. So specifically, the falx cerebri can be found diving between both cerebral hemispheres, between the right and the left cerebral hemispheres. So on this picture, we'll see the falx cerebri diving in here, separating the left and the right cerebral hemispheres. We'll find the cerebellar tentorium diving into the space between the cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellar hemispheres. So we'll actually find the cerebellar hemispheres diving in this space right here, separating the cerebrum from the cerebellum.
And lastly, we'll find the Falk cerebelli, which can be found sitting in between both cerebellar hemispheres. So the Falk cerebri will separate both cerebral hemispheres, the Falk cerebelli will separate both cerebellar hemispheres, and the cerebellar tentorium is separating cerebral hemispheres from cerebellar hemispheres. So here we can see an animation where the brain has actually been removed from the cranial cavity and we can actually still see these dural septa. So specifically shown right here, this is the Falk's cerebri. This is an invagination of our dura mater that sits in between our two cerebral hemispheres. Down here you'll see the Falk's cerebelli, and this is going to be a very tiny invagination, but this will sit between both cerebellar hemispheres. And lastly is the cerebellar tentorium, which can be found right here coursing to the side. The cerebellar tentorium will sit between the cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellar hemispheres. So on the right side we have a frontal section to show you what this would look like from this plane as well. The inner layer of this dura mater is actually going to fold inward and actually partition and sit between both of those hemispheres. You can see that this is the Falk's cerebri sitting right here in the center, and so that's telling us that these two hemispheres are going to be cerebral hemispheres. Now we'll still have the innermost pia mater that sits on the outside of the brain itself, and then we'll have our middle layer of arachnoid mater that's actually going to be attaching to the pia mater through different projections. So the overall arrangement of the cranial meninges is the same as it is in the spinal cord. However, because we have different hemispheres and we want to keep our brain from juggling around inside the cranial cavity, we have to add these dural septa to keep our brain in place. So even though we no longer have the epidural space, we'll still find the subdural space and the subarachnoid space in the spaces below the dura mater and below the arachnoid mater, respectively. The arachnoid mater has little projections that span the subdural space, and these projections are eventually going to attach onto the pia mater. And this is actually where the arachnoid mater gets its name, because there are lots of different web-like projections that are protruding from it. The subarachnoid space is going to contain cerebrospinal fluid, which is the third structure that protects our brain, and we'll also find some large blood vessels in the subarachnoid space that take blood to the brain. And our innermost layer is the pia mater. This is going to attach it to the brain itself, and it's going to follow the irregular shape of the brain. So the brain has lots of folds on it. You can see that at this location we have this infolding of our brain, and out here we have these bulging portions. And we have names for these infoldings and projections that come out of our brain. So the invaginations are called sulci. We call this a sulcus. And at this location where the brain is jutting outwards, we call this a gyrus. And so the pia mater is going to follow both the gyri and the sulci that can be found on the brain. That's how tightly the pia mater is clinging to our brain tissue. So we'll often refer to gyri as hills and sulci as valleys. Now, if we can remember from chapter 12, neurons have a very, very high metabolic rate, which means that they require a lot of oxygen. And you can see on this slide how important oxygen is to our brain. The brain is actually going to use one-fifth of all of the oxygen that we bring into our bodies. That is 20% of the body's oxygen supply is going to go and be used by the brain. So it's very important that our neurons have the oxygen that they need in order to keep on running. And if some type of blood clot or disruption in the oxygen supply is present, that can cause a lot of damage to our nervous tissue that can be found in the brain. So the brain can only survive without oxygen for a very, very limited time, a couple minutes to be exact. And this is why life events such as a stroke are so damaging, because this limits the oxygen supply to the central nervous system and causes lots of cell death in the brain. So the brain has a very, very great need for oxygen, and this is due to all of the neurons that are housed within the brain that have a very high metabolic rate. So there's actually an additional protective layer that we can find in the brain, and that is referred to as the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is a series of very, very tight junctions that's formed by various cells in the brain. So these various cells will wrap around the blood vessels that supply blood to the brain, and carefully regulate which substances can diffuse in or out of the bloodstream. As I mentioned, the blood-brain barrier is a protective layer, and it's protective because it prevents certain neurotoxins and different pathogens from making their way into the central nervous system. So the blood-brain barrier is selective. It has certain things that it allows to come into the central nervous system, 
but it keeps other, more dangerous substances from making their way into the brain and causing damage. So the major cell that forms the blood-brain barrier are the astrocytes. Astrocytes are one of our neuroglial cells that we find in the central nervous system. Astrocytes are going to wrap around blood vessels and carefully regulate the substances that are entering the central nervous system. We'll also have endothelial cells, which are the cells that line the blood vessels. And these cells working together form a very, very selective barrier. So this serves as a bonus layer of protection to keep our central nervous system intact. The central nervous system, being the system that controls all of our other body systems, needs to remain protected at all times. If the central nervous system is compromised in some way, that could compromise all of our other body systems and our entire body could break down. Now while the blood-brain barrier does do its part in keeping dangerous substances out of the brain, it can also at times be a hindrance when we're talking about pharmacology and treating different patients with certain drugs. So the blood-brain barrier is so effective at times that it actually keeps out drugs that we are trying to administer to the central nervous system. So it's important that when synthesizing drugs and creating new drug treatments for individuals, that we're taking into account the blood-brain barrier and whether or not our drug is able to cross that blood-brain barrier. So substances that can cross the blood-brain barrier freely are substances that our neurons use to make energy. Of course, glucose is going to be able to cross the blood-brain barrier because our neurons have a very high need for glucose. Some amino acids are allowed to cross the blood-brain barrier as well as certain electrolytes as well. However, at the same time, metabolic wastes and certain larger proteins are not able to make their way across the blood-brain barrier. Fat-soluble molecules tend to have an easier time, so it's important to take this into account when we're synthesizing different drugs that are meant to act on the central nervous system. Now it's also important to mention that the blood-brain barrier can be damaged and if our blood-brain barrier undergoes some type of damage that can loosen up the junctions between our different cells and allow certain substances to leak into the brain that not normally would have been able to pass. So the blood-brain barrier is a very effective wall against harmful substances making their way into the brain. However, it is also very susceptible to damage and needs to be taken into account when we are applying different drugs to certain patients. Now the next topic that we're going to discuss are the ventricles. Ventricles are cavities found within the brain that contain cerebrospinal fluid. We have several different ventricles that we can find and all of our ventricles will connect with each other and allow the exchange of cerebrospinal fluid between their insides. All ventricles are lined by ependymal cells, which are the epithelial cells of our central nervous system. Ependymal cells are going to contain cilia and that will help to circulate the cerebrospinal fluid within these ventricles. All of the ventricles are also continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord. So specifically, we have four ventricles. We have two lateral ventricles, which are ventricles one and two. Those are found housed within the cerebrum. Our third ventricle is housed in the diencephalon and connects to both of the lateral ventricles. And it will also connect to the fourth ventricle through a structure known as the cerebral aqueduct. So let's take a look at each of these ventricles and see where we can find them. The two lateral ventricles are the largest and they're found up here. These are found housed within the cerebral hemispheres themselves, and there's one on either side. And because the right and the left ventricles are identical, we just call these ventricles 1 and 2. These lateral ventricles will be continuous with the third ventricle that's housed within the diencephalon. And the third ventricle will connect to the fourth ventricle, which can be found down here, through the cerebral aqueduct. And then that fourth ventricle is going to be continuous with the central canal. So all of these ventricles are continuous with one another, and they all contain cerebrospinal fluid. They will also all be lined by ependymal cells, which are circulating the cerebrospinal fluid that can be found inside. So cerebrospinal fluid is a substance that's very vital to the health of our central nervous system. Cerebrospinal fluid facilitates the transport of oxygen and glucose to our nervous tissue cells. And on top of exchanging nutrients and wastes with our blood and the nervous tissue cells, cerebrospinal fluid also offers our body a protective function, which we saw a few slides ago. So cerebrospinal fluid allows for the diffusion of nutrients to make their way to the cells of the nervous system, and it will also help take waste products out of the central nervous system back to the blood. Cerebrospinal fluid is synthesized and secreted by the choroid plexuses, which are capillaries that can be found in the roof of our ventricles. 
Now remember, for both the brain and the spinal cord, cerebrospinal fluid serves a protective function. And I explained in chapter 13 that cerebrospinal fluid acts as a shock absorber. Essentially, this liquid is found within the cranial cavity, and the brain is surrounded with cerebrospinal fluid, and it's floating inside of the cranial cavity. And on top of cerebrospinal fluid exchanging good things with bad things in the central nervous system, it's also going to help cushion the brain inside of the cranial cavity. So now that we've discussed the ventricles, the blood-brain barrier, and the meninges of the brain, we're now going to get into the different anatomical parts of the brain specifically. There are lots of parts and regions to the brain, and each part provides a different function for the body. So we're going to start to look at each of these different parts and see how each of these parts serve the whole body. So the brainstem is the first major brain region that we're going to focus on. Now the brainstem is composed of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And we see all of those regions shown right down here. The brainstem is named because it stems out from the brain and will eventually give rise to the spinal cord. Because the brainstem is the first region of the brain that the spinal cord is connected to, the spinal cord will be sending signals up to the brain through the brainstem. But the brainstem will also play some major other roles in the body. The brainstem controls activities that are extremely integral for our body's survival. Things such as our heart rate, breathing rate, and blood pressure are all going to be regulated by the brainstem. So let's break down each of these three regions of the brainstem and see what each of them do. The medulla oblongata, also often called the medulla, is the last region of the brain that connects with the spinal cord. It's the lowest region that can be found down here. Now remember, the spinal cord brings sensory information up to the brain and motor information out from the brain. So the medulla is also going to contain both motor and sensory tracts. Many of our automatic behaviors for survival are coming from the medulla, such as heart rate and respiratory rate. Our coughing, vomiting, and sneezing centers are also found housed within the medulla oblongata as well. All of these behaviors are automatic, and they serve a purpose for protecting the body. So it's notable that the medulla controls some of these automatic behaviors. If the medulla fails, our entire body is going to fail. So this is an extremely vital portion of our brain. The pons is the second part of the brainstem, and we can find it sitting just on top of the medulla oblongata. Now the pons, which is in such close proximity with the medulla, is also going to carry sensory information up to the brain and motor information out from the brain. The pons serves as another highway by which the sensory and motor information can travel to and from the brain. So one of the more important functions of the pons is to take motor impulses to the cerebellum. Many motor impulses will originate up here in the cerebrum, and they'll travel down through the pons and go into the cerebellum. And we'll see in a couple slides what the cerebellum does with that information once it gets there. But the pons is serving to bring that motor information into the cerebellum. Now lastly for the brainstem is the midbrain. The midbrain is found just above the pons and just below the diencephalon. Now the midbrain is also serving as a major highway for sensory and motor information to get to and from the brain. We will see some subregions within the midbrain known as the cerebral peduncles and the corpora quadrigemina. But aside from controlling certain visual and auditory reflexes, the midbrain is serving the same function as the pons and the medulla which all come together to make up the brainstem. Now the cerebellum is our next principal part of the brain that we're going to discuss. We can see the cerebellum looking very characteristic back here found at the base of the brain. Now the major function of the cerebellum is to coordinate different skeletal muscle movements. With most body movements, we have to add the action of more than one muscle group in order to carry out that action successfully. So one of these actions that the cerebellum will control is balance. Balance requires the coordination of specific and precise muscle contractions of different muscle groups. So the cerebellum is helping to take these different muscle movements and coordinate them in a way that we can produce different muscle actions. So the cerebellum is taking in motor information about all of these different minute muscle contractions and merging them together to form some type of muscle movement. Now our next major brain region is referred to as the diencephalon, and we can see the diencephalon found right here in the center of the brain. The diencephalon sits just above the midbrain, and it's composed of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus.
The thalamus is the central portion of the diencephalon. It sits right here in the middle of the brain. The hypothalamus will project off of the front, and it's going to be attached to the pituitary gland through a little stalk known as the infundibulum. And the epithalamus will be found projecting off of the back of the thalamus, and we're going to discuss the functions of each of these three parts. So with the exception of our olfactory information, which just refers to our sense of smell, all of our sensory information converges at the thalamus. The thalamus will then send all of that integrated sensory information up to the cerebral cortex where we can make some sense out of that sensory information. The thalamus is playing a major role in sensation, however it's also playing a major role in learning and memory. Sensory information is directly tied to our learning and our memory. And this is why certain sensations are associated with different people, different events, and different memories. The next part of our diencephalon is the hypothalamus. Now the hypothalamus is found towards the front and towards the bottom of the thalamus. We can see the thalamus right here and the hypothalamus right here. Now remember, the diencephalon contains the third ventricle. Now the major notable function of the hypothalamus is that the hypothalamus is going to control the entire endocrine system. And it does this by carefully regulating the pituitary gland. So projecting off of the hypothalamus, shown right here, is this little stalk known as the infundibulum. And this little stalk is connecting the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland has also been referred to as the master gland. And this is the gland that regulates the endocrine system and other endocrine organs and what they're secreting. We also see the hypothalamus regulating our body's temperature, our food and water intake, as well as our sleep-wake cycle which all fall under the umbrella of homeostasis. The hypothalamus is a major regulator of our body's homeostasis. So we'll also see some autonomic control coming out of the hypothalamus as well. Now lastly for the diencephalon is the epithalamus. Now there's really only one thing that I want you to be aware of for the epithalamus, and that is that the epithalamus contains a structure known as the pineal gland. The pineal gland is one of our endocrine organs, and its function is to secrete melatonin. Melatonin is the major hormone that regulates our sleep-wake cycle. So with the epithalamus and the hypothalamus, our diencephalon is the major player that controls our sleep-wake cycle. Now here is a summary slide regarding the diencephalon. I post this here for your own study purposes, so feel free to take a look at this. Now that will take us into the cerebrum. So the cerebrum contains both gray matter and white matter. In comparison to the spinal cord, our cerebrum's gray matter is found on the outside and the white matter is found on the inside. Now the outer gray matter, composed of billions of neuronal cell bodies, is termed the cerebral cortex. And this is where we can see all of the gyri and the sulci. Now found just below the cerebral cortex is our white matter. And we know that white matter is composed of myelinated axons and in the central nervous system we call these tracts. So there's a very special white matter structure that can be found right here. All of this up here is gray matter, but this little structure right here in the center is actually white matter, and this has been sectioned so that we can see it, but this structure is termed the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum contains different white matter tracts that are going to connect the two cerebral hemispheres. So we can see the cerebrum here, we can see the different gyri that are jutting outwards, and we can see the sulci that are folding inwards. Now you might have noticed by now that some invaginations are a little bit more pronounced than others, and extremely large invaginations are termed fissures. These are just really, really deep sulci. So this little section will show us the difference. You can see that this right here is showing us a sulcus, and this right here is showing us a gyrus. But right here in the center where we have this very large invagination, this is a fissure. And there are two specific fissures that we see on the brain. We have the longitudinal fissure, and we have the transverse fissure. Both of these fissures can be found on the cerebrum. So the longitudinal fissure will course anteriorly to posteriorly. This moves right down the center of the cerebrum, and it separates the two hemispheres of the cerebrum as well. Now, if you can think back to the meninges when we talked about dural septa, I also mentioned that one of these dural septa will be sitting between the two cerebral hemispheres, and that is the falx cerebri. So the falx cerebri will actually sit in this longitudinal fissure. So the longitudinal fissure gives us our right hemisphere and our left hemisphere. 
Now we also will see the transverse fissure, which is not going to be shown on this slide. However, we do see the transverse fissure in the sagittal section. So the transverse fissure separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. And inside of this fissure, we will find the cerebellar tentorium. Now each hemisphere of the brain is going to contain individual lobes. Lobes are just regions of the brain that regulate certain function. Now we have several lobes of the brain, and not all of them are shown on this slide, but a couple of them shown here are the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. The frontal lobe sits at the front of the cerebrum, the parietal lobe sits just below the parietal bones, and the occipital lobe will sit at the back of the brain just nestled in with the occipital bone. Now this is a better picture to show you the different lobes, and this picture also includes the temporal lobe, which is our other major brain lobe. So you can see the frontal lobe up here at the front, you can see the parietal lobe right here where the parietal bones are going to be found, you can see the occipital lobe here in the back. This is going to be our major visual center, this is where visual information comes in. And we also will have the temporal lobe, which will be found just below the temporal bone. Each of these lobes are going to house different areas that control different sensory and motor functions. Now before we get into each of these different areas, I just want to take a quick second to mention the insula. The insular cortex is found deeper within the brain, and this is the area of our brain that controls the sensation of disgust. Now within the cerebrum, we'll see our lateral ventricles housed, as well as certain spots of gray matter. Collections of cell bodies in the central nervous system are called nuclei, and that's what we're going to talk about next. So the basal nuclei are made up of three different paired masses of gray matter found within the cerebrum. These three nuclei are termed the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. And we can see each of these spots of gray matter shown right here. You can see up here is the caudate nucleus. We can see the putamen right here. And the globus pallidus is actually two different segments found in here. Each of these different nuclei are going to have their own functions. But together, the basal nuclei are very important for helping to regulate movements. So controlling the amplitude of movements, as well as starting and stopping movements, are all activities that are coming from the basal nuclei. The basal nuclei are also going to help us to suppress movements that are unwanted. So we'll actually see the basal nuclei as an area of concern for Huntington's disease, which is a hyperkinetic disorder. In a hyperkinetic disorder, there's too much movement. So the basal nuclei is unable to suppress certain unwanted movements. Now we can see down here that the globus pallidus and the putamen are very, very closely associated with each other. Oftentimes we call this group of nuclei the lentiform nucleus. So if I was to ask on a test which nuclei contribute to the basal nuclei, the correct answer could be the caudate, globus pallidus, and the putamen, or the caudate nucleus as well as the lentiform nucleus. Now the limbic system is another section of the cerebrum. The major fact that I'd like you to know about the limbic system is that the limbic system is in charge of giving us emotions. So if you see emotions on the test, you want to think limbic system. These are two words that really will need to be associated, limbic system and emotion. Those are going to go hand in hand. So since the limbic system is our emotion center, and it can also be found running through the hypothalamus, this is how we can explain certain emotional conditions causing physical illness. Certain emotions, if strong enough, can cause things like high blood pressure. And that's because increased activity in the limbic system can potentially affect the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus is also going to be helping to control our autonomic nervous system, which we'll discuss in Chapter 15. Now, just as a side note, the reticular formation is not actually part of the cerebrum. It can be found in the brainstem. You can see the reticular formation shown here in green. The reticular formation contains the reticular activating system, which controls body activities such as consciousness and attention. So if the reticular formation is damaged in some way, this can result in inattention or unconsciousness.